Hi everyone, welcome to the Editorial Edge for the 6th of July 2023. I'm Bhuvan once again. Welcome to each one of you. Good morning, Bulbul. Welcome. Welcome, guys. So, uh, before we begin, very quickly, if you can just let me know in the chat if you can hear me all right, see me all right, all systems are a go, then we can begin. Okay. We have a topic that is going to be extremely relevant for you from the prelims point of view. Specifically, because again, what you're looking at is a topic that is often asked by UPSC. All right. So you would be best advised to pay attention, especially for the first topic that we are going to do today. That's to do with natural gas uh, hydrates, okay, the NGH. So that's going to be our first topic. Again, a topic that is critical, okay. You can't overlook this topic if you are preparing for prelims. And obviously, in terms of India's energy security and all of those connotations, it will obviously be there for means. But from the prelims perspective, absolutely undeniable. Okay. And then the second topic that I have for you today is to do with decoupling and de-risking, which a term that I had introduced in yesterday's class. In fact, on more than one occasion, we have spoken about it in passing, but we never really have gone in depth on it. So, in, in specifically just at the end of yesterday's class, one student had this question that I missed actually about decoupling and de-risking. So, we'll take a look at that. Good morning, Pratik, Alekha. Welcome, welcome. Okay. So, uh, before we begin, these are the two topics, guys. NGH, as well as the debate on decoupling versus de-risking. But before I go ahead and start this class today, uh, one quote I wanted to share. Now, I generally don't share quotes. But so, the kind of emails that I have been getting from students who are more, uh, say, focused on the larger strategy. For that, I went ahead and I did an, uh, uh, like a video on it, telling you what should be a strategy going forward. Last night, I did a presentation on what are the challenges that you will face, okay? So, I have addressed those. However, I still find those uh, uh, doubts coming in. So, I just wanted to uh, introduce a quote today, you know, just tell you about something that is genuinely important for you to know. And th that is the, this is the quote, guys. A man of words and not of deeds is like a garden full of weeds. And when the weeds begin to grow, then doth the garden overflow, which means that eventually you will have to begin. The time for talking, time for strategizing is up till a limit. Eventually, you'll have to put it in action. Okay. So, start. Start your preparation. Don't worry about what's going to happen in October, November, December. Prelims mein kya hoga? Just begin first. Start with the NCRTs. Start with the core textbooks. Follow the news daily. And you will see a compounding effect in your knowledge. That will just take place in, say, the first six, seven weeks. Okay, so give yourself that time. Hi, Deepak. You're absolutely... Uh, good morning, Deepak. Oh, good to know. Good to know. I hope you use my code, did you? <laughs> then I'll get alerted to your batch. So, okay. Good to know, Deepak. Eduaj, good morning. So, anyways, so this is what I wanted to say, you know. Time for strategizing. I have addressed that uh, thoroughly. So, go ahead and, and see those videos if you have any doubts. Reach out to me on my email ID if you have any doubts. But then start, it, start putting it into action, guys. It's time now, okay? Alright, so let's begin. This is my Telegram channel. For those of you who are joining me for the first time, well, go ahead, join this Telegram channel. I put the first information of all the sessions that we are to do here. And thereafter, we come here. Okay? Thanks, Deepak. Very kind of you. Extremely kind of you. Alright. So guys, first topic, natural gas hydrates and thereafter decoupling versus de-risking, which a student had asked in yesterday's class, but I just missed it by the whisker of an eye actually. So before I discuss what natural gas hydrates are, okay, let's go back to the NCRTs first. Let's begin from where you are supposed to begin. Okay. So let's look at first what are conventional gas sources, what are unconventional gas sources. Hi Kevin, welcome. Okay. So, first conventional and unconventional. Dikhte. So, you know what conventional gas is. Natural gas, which is extracted from the earth, which is just pulled from the earth's surface. That is natural gas. Right? So, what's the procedure? You have first, you explore an area, then you drill through it, then you pump it, and then finally you abandon. I'll explain it to you. Don't worry. First, understand what happens. Fossil fuel. All these fossils are here right now at the base. Okay? Finally, they all uh, decompose over the ages and form natural gas. Now, that gas, what happens is, starts going upward. Now, you know that there is a lot of rocks no, in the Earth's crust. It's absolutely rocky feature. So, once these gas, 
you know, these small, small, minute, minute gas, gas particles, once they start going upwards, they encounter, say, rocks. Now, rocks are of two kinds. One type of rocks that have pores, which allow these gases to seep through upwards. Okay. Then there is the second type of rock, which does not have pores. So, what happens? If you encounter a rock that has pores, well, the gas keeps going up. It keeps seeping up, no? So, it will keep going up. Eventually, it will encounter a rock which will not have pores, which will be hard and sturdy. So, what happens there? These gas particles, gas molecules that are coming up eventually, now they get trapped. So, this is called a trap, where the rock is so sturdy that the gas is unable to seep through or seep ahead. So, now that the gas is trapped, what do we humans do? Hi Rajan, good morning. So, what do we do? We go ahead and exploit it. A reservoir is formed, a large rocky feature under which lies a lot of natural gas. So, you drill through the rocky feature, pump it. See, first you explore, find out. Then after you drill through it, because it's a rocky feature, no? It's rocks. It's hard, sturdy rocks. So, you have to drill through them reach the area where there are these gases, start pulling it out. Now, what happens eventually? You know that the pressure difference at a particular point will normalize between the upper, upper area and the lower area. So, the flow suddenly goes slow. At that moment, what you start doing? You start pumping so that you pull out whatever gas is there. After you have pulled out everything, then finally you abandon that site. Is this clear to everyone first? How do you go ahead and drill or drill say for natural gas? Extremely basic from the premise point of view, have an overview of what happens exactly. Okay. Now we come to unconventional sources. So you can straight away understand this is an easier process. No? There's not a lot of difficulty involved. You just have to drill through rocks, okay, pump out the gas, abandon the site, natural gas requirements met, energy security met. On the other side, what happens is, then you have non-conventional gas sources. Note down these terms for the prelims point of view, guys. Okay, I will include them in uh, the, the Telegram channel, the PDF that I share in the Telegram channel. But make sure that you're noting these down. If, you're, if you do have a notebook that you keep for this uh, daily news analysis, it's good. If you don't, take a note of it in your copies. Okay. So, what is shale gas? What is tight gas? What is gas hydrates? and what are coal, bed, methane. All four important. Today, we are discussing this gas hydrates. Okay, eventually, we'll cover all of them. Don't worry. Okay, so first one, shale gas. You must have heard of it if you have been reading your Hindu, your Express. These are trapped in shale deposits. For now, if you are just writing as, as a first attempter, just know this much. It's gas that is trapped in shale deposits. Then you have tight gas which is trapped in rocks, which are unable to be drilled through. Because not all rocks can be drilled through. No? It's after all hard rocks. So, those rocks which you can drill through, ban gaya aapka conventional. Those rocks that you can't, it's tightly knit, you know. These gas molecules are such tightly knit that you can't explore that area. So, it becomes tight gas. Then today what we are doing, gas hydrates, we'll discuss it in detail. It's essentially to do with gas molecules now in ice. Abhi tak aap kya kar rahe the? Oceans ka dekh rahe the. Abhi ice hai, matlab permafrost hai, but at the same time you also find it in ocean. So, we'll take a deep dive into it. Okay? Pratik, don't worry. Aaj ke class mein I'll tell you. Just, just bear with me. I'll tell you. Finally, you have coal bed methane. Okay? Now, what happens is when coal is being formed, you know, when coal is being essentially formed right at the basic, at the, at the, at the basic pe of form ho raha hota hai. So, you see that methane gas is also produced in the formation of coal. Now, what happens? Have you seen Vasipur? You see how they put water in the coal to make it heavier. Similarly, coal has this absorbing property. Have you seen Vasipur, guys? Where they put water in coal to make it heavier and then sell it so that they get more money. So, what do you understand by that scene? That coal has absorbing properties, which means this methane gas that is produced around the coal when it is being formed, is also absorbed by the coal. So, you are looking to harness that methane gas. Okay. 
So that is coal bed methane, where the CH4, the methane produced during coal formation is absorbed in coal. Okay? Are you clear first? Don't worry about what is shale gas, what is tide gas. First, no. Kaun sa cheese kahan pe hai? Okay? I'll tell you Pratik. Don't worry. Abhi batayenge. First, are you clear with this? Give me a yes if you are clear with this first. Very quickly. The, uh, the basics need to be on point. Thereafter, it's a very easy story. Jaldi bataye. Hi. Hi, Sri Lakshmi. Welcome. Welcome. All right. Okay. We'll move forward. Now let's look at what are natural gas hydrates. So obviously what you're talking about is this. This particular element is what we're talking about. Okay. A part of the unconventional or non-conventional gas sources. So now let's look at it. Natural gas hydrates, they are considered to be a promising source of natural gas, obviously. Firstly, first things first, unconventional gas sources, part of say tide gas, shale gas, coal bed methane, gas hydrates, which means there is some source, some potential. Now they occur in permafrost. Please understand what is permafrost. The area which is permanently frozen, so near the Arctics, Antarctics, the higher reaches of Himalayas also have say permanent ice throughout the year. Okay, So that area is called permafrost. Wherever you have ice formation on a permanent basis. All right. And oceanic elements or sediments where suitable pressure and temperature conditions prevail. Two areas, guys. Make a note of this. One you find in permafrost, which is where you have ice always. And then you find deep in oceans, oceanic sediments. Make a note of this because this is a factual area that you will have to remember or at least you will be able to correlate what happens. I'll tell you now. Permafrost, okay, it's buried under the ice, fine. Next, number two, the oceanic sediments. What you're looking at is deep, deep, deep depth, okay? You're really going deep in the ocean. So at this area, where you're really deep in the ocean, the pressure will be extremely high, whereas the temperature will be extremely low. Can you understand this first? You don't have to remember. I'm telling you. Imagine this recent uh, Titanic thing that happened, no? The vessel that was going uh, just deep down to explore the Titanic wreckage. What happened? It probably disintegrated because of high pressure. Structural problem was there with that vessel. So it disintegrated under high pressure. Right? At the same time, you know, deep in the ocean, sunlight does not go through, which means the temperature is very, very, very low. That is the perfect condition that you have for formation of gas hydrates. Okay? They are solid crystalline composed of water cages containing gas molecules. So here, have a look at this first. You will be able to understand. Yes. Look at this figure, then it will be easier for you to correlate what I am talking about. So you have this particular lattice that is followed. Okay? Where you have, say, the methane molecule in the center which is covered by the water molecules. So it is trapped like this. Just remember, don't need, don't need, don't need to like mug it up. Essentially, it's methane that is surrounded by ice in the form of water. Good morning, Bhaskar. Okay, so let's go back now. Methane is a dominant gas. As you can understand, methane is in the middle. It is surrounded by water from all sides. It's trapped in a water cage. So, methane is a dominant gas. Traces of other hydrocarbon gases also occur. So, you have say, propene and ethylene, but in many minor traces. Okay. So, essentially looking at a majority of methane that is trapped. Now, permafrost region, the depth that which you have to go to find say, these kind of gas hydrates. How deep should you go? At, in the permafrost, you are looking at lower depth. In the oceanic margins, offshore continental margins essentially, yeah, deep in the ocean, you are looking at a higher depth. Okay. Why is this? Because the same conditions that are necessary for formation of gas hydrates, okay, you will have to go really deep in the ocean along say continental margins to find the same conditions that exist in permafrost. Clear now? This is where they are found. Two areas, remember this, permafrost plus deep inside the oceans. 
Why deep inside the oceans? Because you need high pressure, the whole pressure of the ocean plus low temperature because you are deep inside the ocean. Clear? Let's go forward. So why are they important now? If we know that they are okay, un unconventional gas source, where they are found. But what's the importance? So the amount of gas within the world's gas hydrates is exceeding all known conventional gas resources. Conventional gas resources, I told you, you, know, you just extract from the earth's surface. This is like, you know, it's estimated almost around uh, three to four times. You know, three to four times it is estimated. But what could be the challenges? Straight away realize, now that I've given you the background, what could be the challenges? First major challenge you're looking at is it is a very costly process. Okay, capital intensive process. You really have to go down deep 4,000 meters. Plus, if you have to explore Arctic shelf, that permafrost that exists, you are going to have to break through ice. Will that be easy? No, not at all. So, it's a costly process, firstly. Okay. In India, gas hydrates uh, resources are estimated at okay, huge amount. So, if we are able to say explore this and harness this, you are looking at energy security being taken care of. Also, the fact that our net zero target, no? Net zero target by 2070. So, this will help there too. Now you will ask me how sir, because methane is there. So how can it help in net zero? Is that a question that's coming to your mind? Because methane is again a, a warming gas, a greenhouse gas. So how will it help us in emitting net zero? Well, what you have to realize is that uh, this is far more efficient than using coal. What we are using right now. Okay. So the emission levels will be reduced. Which means you are going from, say, the bigger of the two evils to the lesser of the two evils. Okay, So, it's always going to be a positive step, even if we are looking at it from the environment point of view. Is this clear? Now, gas hydrates are also important for C4 stability, as you can study. You know, when the process of extracting, you can study more about the seafloor landslides and what happens exactly. Since you have to go down that deep, you are looking at other, uh, say, other advantages out of this whole process. Okay, you're not just going to pull out gas, you're also going to do massive studies on the oceanic depth. Now, you will realize this is a topic we have discussed in the past that say around 60% of our oceans is still to be explored. Yes, mankind, humankind has more knowledge of say the space than our oceans, which means that such a step, if again, if, if technology were to be developed to harness this, you're looking at the other benefits also. Okay, using methane, from gas hydrates as an energy resource would be compared to other hydrocarbons relatively climate friendly. Okay, as combustion of methane is twice as efficient as burning coal. Look at this. Okay, so it's the lesser of the two evils. It's not completely clean. Obviously, it's methane. How can it be clean? But then, if you are to burn coal, you are looking at a lot more pollution. If you are looking at say 100% pollution from coal, this is at 50%. Twice. So, you are going to cut down your pollution levels half by just by half by using this as an energy resource. Clear? Let's go forward now. So, these are where they are found. Now, what I have told you is two areas that you have to look for. One is permafrost and one is deep inside the oceans along say the continental shelves. Okay. So, look at it here now. You are looking at areas around the Arctic Circle, around continental shelves. Okay. Look at it, Law, most of it in America's Arctic, Russia side in fact, whole of it. Okay, So, let's look at the few major ones in fact. Where are the major? Okay, we'll come to it. Alright, so you have North Slope in Alaska, major place of this. Then there is one called the Nankai Trough, make a note of this, Okay, the Nankai Trough. From the geography maps based point of view guys, I am going to give you a set of places I would expect that after the class ends, go ahead and look at these places. Okay, that's how you'll study maps. Randomly, utha ke nahi chalu kar dena ki kuch bhi dekh rahe. Okay, so whatever you learn today after the class ends, go ahead and have a look at uh, the map places that we discuss. Okay, that I would expect from you. So make a note of the Nankai Trough, which is in Japan, which is one of the earliest places where you started exploring. Mankind started exploring for natural gas hydrates. 
In fact, you will realize Japan is a major mover and player in this uh, segment. Okay, it has extensive uh, uh, technology, know-how, how to do it. You know, it's, so they know it very well. So we'll see more of it. All right. So what happens exactly? Look at this. You have oceanic deposits that are in, embedded in sediments. Okay. Now you have these hydrate mounds. So you see, it starts going up. Okay. Eventually, the methane is trapped. You find a sturdy rock source and then you go ahead, drill it, take it out. Now the problems with this guys. One problem you have to realize is that since it is in ice form, remember I told you, it is in ice form and it requires a particular pressure and a temperature. So the problem is when you start extracting it. So now when it comes to say the oceanic surface, you are looking at a change of pressure and temperature which means the ice disintegrates, which means this whole process comes to zero. It's a very sensitive thing, you know. You have to do it in such a way that the pressure and the temperature conditions are maintained. Only then will you be able to extract gas from that ice trapment that I told you. Methane is trapped by ice on all sides. Jai Hind, Vaibhav. Welcome, welcome. Are you able to understand Vaibhav, Bhaskar, Madhusudan, Bipen? Let me know in the chat. If, if you are able to follow what I am telling you, you will be able to, like, it's a very good connotation. Energy security, ke liye answer mein likhenge aap, it will be brilliant. But from the prelims perspective, for sure, you'll have to prepare for this. Okay? So see, look at this, what happens. If the ice is removed from the temperature pressure environment, it becomes unstable. Because it is so deep, the moment you bring it up, the pressure temperature equalizes or changes happen, which means it becomes unstable. This methane trapped by ice from all sides. Okay, for this reason, methane hydrate deposits are difficult to study. Challenge number two, which means one thing that you know right now is they are not just costly, the product is uncertain. Okay, you need technology essentially to make sure that the conditions in which it exists deep down in the ocean or in under the permafrost, those are to be maintained if you need to harness this. So, they cannot be drilled and bored for study like the other subsurface materials because when they are brought to the surface, the pressure is reduced and the temperature rises. Clear? So, you need something, you need a technology in which this pressure temperature condition gets fulfilled. Okay? If you are unable to maintain the equivalent pressure and temperature in which it exists deep down under the permafrost or the ocean surface, Unless you do that, no point. Jitna paisa laga hoge, sab pani mein Thik? Next. So, where are the major drilling programs? One, the US department is doing it in the Gulf of Mexico. Your first place that you will go and see today. Map based questions. Okay. Korea is doing it in the Uleung Basin. Again, another map based question. You should go and see. Kaha pe hai? South China Sea. Pata to hoga kafi ko. Still go ahead. Have a look at it. All right. And why, finally, the Indian continental margins, which I will show you where we are doing it right now. Okay. This is my expectation from you. You will go back and have a look at all of these three places. Look at the countries that surround it. Look at where the basin is, whether any rivers are draining into the basin, which ocean, which countries around it, all of it. Okay. This is how you are going to prepare, guys. Okay. Ab dekho ye kaha kaha milta hai. Where else is it found? See, look at it. Most of it is in the permafrost, the Arctic side. You are also looking at lot of it in the Russian side because if you have areas here, it's consistently permanently frozen, which means lot of potential for finding natural gas hydrates. You also have US that does it in its Alaskan area. Yeah, the Alaskan area. Okay, you find it there also. Lot of it, in fact. Okay? And then you will find it along the continental margins. Look at this. Continental margins, continental margins. Okay. Do you realize? So it's not that it is not abundant. It is. It can be found abundantly. But the challenges are two and the two challenges are so basic that unless you address them, you cannot move forward. The fundamentals need to be addressed first. Okay. So let's go forward now. So let's look at what India has done so far now. Where is our position vis-a-vis -vis, say the natural gas hydrates? What have we done? Okay. 
so we are looking at this particular agency the national gas hydrate program ngHP it is being spearheaded by the Directorate General of Hydrocarbons and ONGC. ONGC is the arm, the one that is doing the drilling, exploration, whatever it is required. Whereas this is the governing body. Clear? So one PSU, one government department have come together for this purpose. Now established, where have you found it so far? Krishna Godavari Basin, Mahanadi Basin and the Andaman Islands. Make a note of this please. Krishna Godavari Basin is in which state guys? Tell me, where is the Krishna Godavari Basin? Which state? Bataye. Let's have some basics first. Where is, which state has the Krishna Godavari Basin? Bataye. Quickly let me know in the chat. I'll wait. I'm in no rush today. Basics first, guys. Not in Maharashtra. No, no. It's on the eastern sea seaboard. So, Maharashtra can't be there. India ka map dekha hoga, to aapne dekha hoga eastern seaboard ke side hai Krishna Godavari Basin. North in Tamil Nadu. No. No, no, no. Where is the river Krishna? Where is the river Godavari? Godavari is called the Ganges of the south, the Ganga of the south. Okay. So, these converge near Andhra Pradesh, Andhra Pradesh, okay, Andhra, Andhra Pradesh is the primary area where Krishna Godavari Basin is found, okay, correct, good, thank you, my belief in the class is restored, thank you, alright. So, you have Krishna Godavari Basin, Eastern Seaboard, Mahanadi Basin, again Eastern Seaboard and Andaman, Eastern Seaboard, so remember, all our exploration so far, so now, till now, has been along the eastern seaboard, which means towards our eastern sea coast in the Bay of Bengal. Okay. We haven't done any exploration so far as in the Arabian Sea is concerned. Not, not yet that I know of. Okay. All of it has happened along our eastern sea floor. Okay. So, NGHP01. Now, these hydrocarb hydrate programs that I have told you. So, we have had two missions so far or two say submissions, okay, where ONGC and the directorate have gone together and done exploration. This whole process has been followed guys, okay. This process I showed you here. Where is it? Too many slides. Huh. This whole process, no, exploration, drilling, pumping. Besides in this, they have gone ahead and explored first. First, you have to go and see the feasibility studies it is called, okay. How much? is there it is estimated how much money will it take to set up say our own uh, drilling system how much will it take to transport eventually you have to realize that if the costs exceed the benefit it does not make sense to invest in this you would rather say put money in renewables okay so krishna godavari basin is andhra but you are also looking at see the, the larger realm the larger uh, connotation is that it also includes parts of Odisha, okay? You are looking at the olive ridley turtles also that are included in this basin, okay? So, we will discuss that, don't worry. So, first, exploration is done, feasibility studies is carried out. To find out, okay, how much money should the government of India put in? How much can it extract out? Does it give me a correct return of interest at least? Okay, return of investment, sorry. Alright, so let's look at the next one. So, you have NGHP. The first phase of this was in the Krishna Godavari Basin. Thereafter, they went to the Mahanadi Basin and continued in the Krishna Godavari Basin. Okay. Now, it was done with the help of the Japanese. Why? Because again, Nankai Truff. Make a note of this, guys. Ye dekh ke jau ab, agle saal ke exam ke liye. Okay. So, because the Japanese had extensive knowledge in, say, exploration of natural gas hydrates, it was only natural that India government went and sought their help also. So, their vessel, okay, Chikyu, Chikyu came forward, the deep drilling vessel and helped us with our mission. So, look at this, all of this area is what you are looking at, okay. So, you have obviously, this is where the Krishna Godavari Basin is, but this area you are exploring, which is why the olive ridley turtles are a part of this conversation again. We always discuss about this turtle some way or the other. Our class mein iska zikar hoi jata hai. Okay. So, not just say the Krishna Godavari Basin, but the area right up till the coast of Odisha is the area of interest for 
the National Gas Hydrate Project, a program. Okay, now let's go forward. So why are they important then? Okay, the amount of gas within the world's gas hydrate exceed the volume. Oh, we did this. All right. Fine. So what are the challenges, guys? Let me know very quickly first before we go forward. What are the challenges that you can identify? Number one. Oh, blue pen here. Huh. Number one that you have is uh, obviously it is costly endeavor. Okay, because it is costly. So there is lack of public pr private partnership, which is why you see only ONGC and a directorate in doing it right now. Okay. Thereafter, number three, what you're looking at is the rate of return of investment. It needs to be fought off first. At the same time, how feasible is it to invest in a methane exploration technology when with the same amount of money, say, if you invested in renewables, you would say probably do better towards the same net zero emission target. Okay. At the same time, you're looking at uh, uh, the price of the product. Okay. Not just the exploration, but the price of the product. So if you pull out something, if you have invested say 1000 rupees in the whole project, and if you get out say only 15 liters of the product that you need, is it going to be feasible for the consumer also? Can you offer it at a competitive price to the consumer? Because there is no point exploring and then getting say 1000 uh, units of this sample volume, 1000 volume of the natural gas that you have, and no one is there to take it. So it shouldn't be a loss making entity. Okay, right. This is Pratik. I'm telling you the problem is that because it's coming from such depth and its existence is directly correlated to the pressure temperature condition that I told you. So unless you're able to guarantee that it makes no sense by the time it comes up, it will be pani. So kya karo gaya pani ka? Thik hai. All right. So that was natural gas hydrates for you. Uh, go ahead and answer me these questions guys. Go ahead. Let's see. I think I've answered the questions for you anyways. But let's see. Go ahead and answer these questions for me. Where do they occur finally? This is question number A. Okay, and this is B. Let me know in the chat. And if you found this interesting, if you found this informative, quickly leave me a like, guys. What is this? Watching zada hai, like kam hai, aise kaise hoga? Leave, leave a like for me. This, this because it's, it's a very important topic. It requires a lot of effort to prepare this for you. Okay, and it, that's the only thing I expect. <laughs> okay. Okay, well, let's have the answers for question number A. Let's have a look at the answers. Where is it found, guys? Methane hydrates. Thank you, thank you, Hall of Tech. Really appreciate it. Is it found at high pressure and low temperature? Because the temperature drops, sunlight can't go, and the pressure is extremely high, which is why the Titanic submersible sink sunk. So this is correct here. What about this? Question number B. KG Basin located in Andhra Pradesh, correct. Olive Ridley turtles can be found in the KG Basin, absolutely correct, because the basin is again extended. Okay, Olive Ridley turtles can be found. So identify the correct statements, both are correct. Nala Jana, uh, extracted from in-depth means after extraction, we need to do some process to convert it for environmental conditions. See, Nala Jana, understand it in a simple manner. When you're looking at uh, uh, the NGH, no, the problem with it is it is stability. Okay, if, if it was stable, then we would just have to worry about the cost bit because it is not stable. Okay. So you need tech that will maintain its stability in terms of pressure and temperature conditions that are required so that the methane molecule does not disintegrate, which is surrounded by the ice molecules. You know, these are all ice. So unless you're able to guarantee this, that's the problem. Because by the time it comes up, if the ice and, and, and the methane do not exist in the same manner that they existed in the depth of the ocean or under the permafrost, then they are not going to be of any point. You know, it's going to be a fruitless exercise. Samajdeva, thank you for your answers. Asha, Deepak, Kevin, Pratik, 
थैंक यू सो मच रियली ग्लैड ऑल राइट ओके सो नाउ हैव अ सिप ऑफ योर चाय एज बिफोर वी गो फॉरवर्ड फॉर द नेक्स्ट टॉपिक अगेन a brief reminder today we had deepak who i am very happy to share with you he signed up uh, for the p2i again class is beginning on the 10th i am a part of the english cohort so if you want to make sure that i am a part i remain a part of your preparation up until the examinations up until your mains interviews well go ahead sign up for the p2i course it's a morning batch that begins on uh, the 10th of this month every morning 8 am is when your classes get held obviously at the same time that you are here right now and again if you were to use the code ba live well firstly you get it for a discounted price secondly you get two books okay and thirdly i am a part of your prep right up until the day you enter dholpur house in chajaha road for your interviews okay in fact i'll be there right outside waiting to see how you have done okay so make sure you use the code ba live and we begin on the 10th the orientation is planned at 8 am on the 10th so for those of you who have signed up you will be receiving all the details everything that is there okay ncert geography book bhaskar what about it it's a brilliant book do you want the pdf of it you should in fact go through it ncert geography is like you learn new things every time you read it okay now that we have done natural gas hydrates now one thing before i move forward why am i putting so much of stress on say topics related to energy environment security minerals if you have seen notice in the last 7 8 days we have done extensively on say mineral security partnership on rare earth elements on gallium on germanium okay bhaskar it will be a part of this uh, p2i if in fact prelims to interview i'll tell you bhaskar just 2 minutes the whole process is from the prelims perspective every ncert book the core textbook the tests that goes first thereafter you are prepared for the mains in which we prepare right now you know this whole thrust on making sure that you can see the larger picture okay and thereafter say the interviews where we will have one to one sessions to make sure that you speak in a manner in which a civil servant should speak you know that you speak say limited words good words your power of uh, expression is on point okay that's that's a major lacuna i find in most aspirants and and it, it's not surprising because our education system does not really put a lot of emphasis on public speaking okay so which is why you find brilliant individuals who can't speak their mind <clears throat> okay so that will also be taken care of okay so uh, the decoupling versus de-risking concept now yesterday's class we had a student who asked this question and i was unable to answer it because we ran out of time so today we should discuss this okay hi hi ramesh welcome so let's look at decoupling versus de-risking now in terms of the usa china relationship if you were to read any article no guys and i say this with the utmost conviction that i have if you were to read any article on usa china relationship you will find that these words are getting used that usa is looking to decouple from china that the global west is looking to de-risk from china so the obvious question that should arise in your mind is what is decoupling what is de-risking these some to these seem to be specific terms so first let's understand the history of it because you will understand it's a problem that is made by usa like most of the problems that exist okay it's a problem they have made themselves and now they are like acha humne problem khada kar diya ab kya kar sakte what can we do now since we have contributed in creation of the problem okay so look at this now after the establishment of diplomatic ties between the us and china in 79 both countries embarked upon a path of increasing economic interdependence okay so you see how usa has gone ahead and dug its own hole first it went said okay hand of friendship okay us china all born homey eventually what happens china gains gains immensely from this relationship both economically as well as integration with the west in fact you would know that after mao zedong have you heard this name mao zedong you will find his photos everywhere he'll be doing this huh? like a revolutionary he was apparently for the chinese so mao zedong he had a policy called uh, the great leap forward okay just make a note of this you will understand the glf the great leap forward wherein mao zedong went ahead and said you know what we are going to invest in community agriculture we are going to do uh, the gandhian version you know in some manner you can rough comparison the gandhian version of empowering communities and local level agriculture but like because it was happening in china it was not gandhian 
it was the Chinese model. So what happened? They went ahead and started coercive measures to have people plant certain crops. Community model of farming was introduced, you know, where if you and I are in a community, we will pool in our resources and grow similar crops. Now, on paper, it's a very good idea. But what happened was monocropping. Most of the people uh, grew similar type of crops. So when the crop failed, everyone's crop failed. Do you realize the problem with that? So the GLF, among many other things, you know, there were all these classrooms where the education was imparted. You know, Chinese always say this, re-education. So education was imparted. Those were the other connotations. This happened. Community farming and monocropping was incentivized. Because of this, when famine stuck, no, so all the monocropping, all the monocrops failed. So the great leap forward failed completely. Okay. Large scale famine in, in, in China was observed. People died like left, right and center. Thereafter came an individual called Den Xiaoping. Now, if you have seen yesterday's class, Xiaoping. Okay. If you have seen yesterday's class, you will remember that we discussed a quote by him, wherein he says the Middle East has its oil, China has its metals, its rare earth. Okay. So, this guy, he is the complete opposite of Mao Zedong now. He is like, let's integrate with the world. At least, let's industrialize on a large scale. Okay. And so, thus, China becomes an industrial, industrial nation, at least starts working towards industrialization. So, you see 1979 as a consequence of this policy, you know, that China is now looking to massively start its uh, industrial progress, you know, they're investing in manufacturing, in industries, in exploration, in extraction of minerals, all of that started then. So, what you see is that during that time, they go ahead and develop friendly relations with the United States. Now, over time, China's ambition to challenge the primacy of the United States becomes increasingly apparent, especially after the turn of the century. After the year 2000, you see that Chinese, like they know that they are within touching distance of United States, that they just need to work hard for another decade and the goal that they had, what Deng Xiaoping had, will come to fruition. And at the same time, they have a person take the top leadership who wants to take this vision forward, you know. You need continuity of, continuity of thought if a nation has to really propel itself. It can't be that if I am the Prime Minister today, I follow policy X. Huh? And then if you become the Prime Minister tomorrow, you follow policy Y, which are completely divergent from each other. Then the nation will get nowhere. There needs to be an overarching uh, agreement on, say, certain areas. The, the new entrant in 2000, Xi Jinping, was absolutely congruent with Deng Xiaoping's vision. Okay. So, China's rise comes at the expense of America's global clout, but also industry. What essentially China does is that they straight away make their, their supply chains uh, so resilient and other countries so uh, dependent on them. And what did the other countries think that time? If you just go back a decade, 2000s, you will realize most countries looked at China for cheap labor, huh? cheap goods. That was the sense that time that everything needs to be cheap so that my value is higher. However, how was China seeing this? That this allows me the opportunity to develop supply chains and industry at such a level that I can dominate their market. Yes, I will make my cheap labor my biggest strength. I will make my style of authoritarianism the, my biggest strength. Do you realize? So, people in China don't have, say, particular labor laws, which allows them to, say, have people work 18, 18 hour shifts. Huh? Imagine in America, the other person will be suing the company if you work for 10 minutes extra. Two different systems. And America's thought was, okay, these people will send me cheap goods. Imagine what happened in 10, 20 years down the line. You are so reliant on their cheap goods that you haven't developed your own system. Kya kiya aapne? Theek hai? So, this is what happened. Next. So now how USA started decoupling? First it realized that it had a massive trade deficit. It was all going one way. Okay. U USA neither had say the cap capacity, the capability or the vision to match Chinese in terms of say manufacturing and industry. Yes, they are very good in say certain industries, defense, uh, tech, good. But when it comes to say day-to-day -day items of sustenance, 
Chinese have the monopoly there. Okay. The US also looks to keep China out of accessing high technology. You know, the critical technology. For example, if you need say laser guided some missiles which require certain size, certain type of tech, US will try to keep it out. Similarly, yesterday's uh, uh, video, if you have seen, huh? China banned germanium and gallium. Remember, we discussed this yesterday at the 9.30 video. If you haven't seen this, go see this. So, China introduced export control to USA for germanium and gallium, two metals. What happened now? What is the connotation of this? Because this is also used in military applications. You see? So, they are so interdependent on each other that it is not just items of say consumer products. You are also looking at military tech. You are looking at semiconductors. If you are talking semiconductors is every electronic item that we use nowadays. Do you realize? US also tried to raise tariffs on Chinese imports. Okay. Now, this obviously ran into some controversy at the WTO. Okay. Because if it's your problem, you made the problem. You did not invest in your own market. You thought that the Chinese and the Indians will send us goods. Guess what? The Chinese have catapulted themselves to a different level now. So, what tariff do you have to do? These are all short term measures. Okay. Which invited retaliatory tariffs. Obviously, why will they stop? They are not your friends anymore. Okay. So, what happened? What is decoupling eventually? It stands for an eventual reversal of the four decade old project to enmesh the two economies that they are so closely linked now. And here you have two closely linked economies, one of which China wants to dominate. So, US is like, nah, 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 let's go for uh, apart now, there's no point. We have played into their hands. That realization now has come to them. Okay. So, the product of that realization is let's decouple from them. Let's, let's like break this marriage of the two economies. And what is de-risking? That you break this marriage in those segments which affects your national security. Two very closely linked terms. Understand it this way. Okay, let me just clear this first. Okay. So, if, if you understand it, decoupling is the larger circle. Okay. And inside this, you have de-risking. Understand it this way. Okay. So, you are looking at pulling apart, you know, having your own independent identity as an economy, as well as de-risk. Make sure that those supply chains that are critical for your economy or for your national security, you have, say, diversification there. Okay. So, de-risking fundamentally means having resilient, effective supply chains and ensuring that US cannot be subjected to the coercion of any other country. So, for example, if China banned germanium and gallium or if it stops export of rare earth elements, these directly affect the critical area of the economy plus military applications, which means if the US goes ahead and looks at other global supply chains, say starts getting it from say Australia or India, then it is de-risking itself from USA. Why? Because the products that come out of those raw materials are critical for your economy. Samajh mein aap ko? Okay. De-risking aims to limit areas where it undercuts the national security and economic competence of the United States. Now, it should be absolutely clear to you that decoupling is the larger concept always. So, decoupling will include say divergence in so far as environmental targets are concerned. You had the US that moved out of the Paris Climate Agreement during Trump's era. China didn't. Now, China wanted to, uh, US wanted to portray it as what? That we are funding the whole thing. We are moving away, away, uh, um, uh, away from this whole process. What essentially are you doing? You are leaving a vacuum. And a vacuum you know as students of physics is always going to be filled. This is what happened. So, now suddenly you, they saw that, okay, China was getting the upper hand when it came to the environmental conservation. Straight away, US ran back in after President Biden came into power. This is what happens. No, lack of foresight. Things happening as an ad hoc basis. Pe chalta waisa. Okay? Let's go forward. So, the geopolitical ramifications. Now, extremely important slide. Okay? Make a note of this because the decoupling, de-risking, this is what you are going to write after you have, say, explained what is decoupling and de-risking. So, please understand that decoupling is 
the US concept, whereas de-risking is more to do with the European Union, especially if you look at, look at their uh, chairperson, it is called Ursula Van something her name is. Okay, so she made a speech just a month ago. So I read that whole speech. You see what she is trying to say? That European Union can't decouple from China. As a whole, they can't because China is a major player in the European market. However, European Union will look to de-risk itself from the Chinese market. Do you realize what it means? That we will break this marriage only for say certain areas where it affects say the capacity or capability of European Union as a monetary union or as a military NATO representative. Whereas USA is more about decoupling altogether. Because if it doesn't, there will come a day when China will be overwhelming the United States. Okay. So the G7 summit which happened recently in Hiroshima. Remember our Prime Minister was invited there. Huh? So in the G7 summit, the approach to economic resilience and economic security, okay, it was led by EU. They essentially said in the G7 summit that we are going to look ahead and de-risk. The de-risking will be the model forward. That we will not look to break this marriage completely. Okay, We will just look to say compromise and get some distance between us in certain areas where we are too closely linked. Especially say in high tech where you have say problems of Chinese privacy. You have companies like Huawei. In our own country you had Tencent. The people who were making PUBG and all of that. Huh? So there are privacy related con concerns. Now this is for you and I as a consumer. Same thing when extrapolated at a military level, that has massive ramifications, which is what they are saying. That's in 5G access technology or in data sharing or data integration of people, of our own people. We don't want the Chinese companies there. De-risking. So what does China do? It has expressed its skepticism to the West's de-risking approach. It essentially blames USA, says the United States is propagating a cold war mindset. Okay, that's what it accuses the USA of. That once again, what you are doing is repeating history and making a villain out of someone who is not a villain. That's what the Chinese say. That we have done no wrong. That all the aggression comes from the United States side. Okay, see the problems of this now. Two minutes you will understand the problems of this. Recently you had the uh, Secretary of State, United States, Antony Blinken. So this fellow went and met the Chinese government just around a month ago, I think. At that time, now a major problem area between these two countries is Taiwan. Now, US has said that they will help Taiwan come what may. China says, Ki hamare bhai bandhu, they are our brothers, US will stay out of it. And if US intervenes, then they will be given a befitting reply. Now, when Secretary Blinken goes to the Chinese government, he says, you know what, we have nothing to do with Taiwan. Huh? Taiwan is your own issue. We don't want to do anything with that. What messaging do you get? The messaging is that US is now backing down. Yes? And, and China will read it as what? You know, in, in, if you see documentaries in jungles, no, you will see that if an old tiger and if a new tiger, if the old tiger does not fight, he will have to leave the territory. It's going to be a fight until death to decide who rules that area. By submitting in front of China, US is giving the power that it has become weaker now. It is giving that impression in fact. Okay. So US's rhetoric against China has dialed down, see, which could be read by the latter as a sign of adversary's weakness. That USA is now, say, not that, you know, being USA that they are, you know, USA, USA, they are not like that anymore. They are suddenly realizing that, okay, China has come a long way and it's fighting on an equal term basis. And so decoupling probably is acceptable only till a certain extent because we are far too interlinked. At the same time, due to the Russia-Ukraine crisis, US has its whole uh, approach uh, focused that side, which means the Indo-Pacific area is not in its say immediate uh, objective, which means China ke liye rasta khali hai. You see? So the problems with that the whole decoupling and de-risking is not just the economic integration and economic disintegration. It is also the ramifications of this economic marriage breaking, which will be seen across in other realms also. Most 
notably in the military realm also. Do you realize? So it is important. How now? What is the way forward? What should USA do? It should essentially come forth as the leader of the free world. You know the fact that USA has been unable to do anything in the Russia-Ukraine crisis, anything decisive at least. That their representatives go to China and take the knee. Huh? They bow down in front of the emperor. It does not give the right messaging. Okay. Which is why you will see India's policy now of strategic autonomy. Yesterday we discussed in, in the class, no, strategic autonomy, multi-alignment. What does it mean? That if India were to be completely aligned with the United States, its interest will always be hampered because you are looking at a weaker United States now. Which is why for Indian foreign policy, it makes sense to put your eggs in multiple baskets, which we do, multi-alignment. Clear? Hai? Are you able to completely understand decoupling, de-risking? If that is the case, let me know in the chat because this is a very important concept if you are writing mains this year. Okay? I would sincerely advise you, Last yesterday also I had mentioned in the class, prepare at least uh, 2000 words on de-risking, decoupling. Okay? Expect at least questions in the mains, GS file paper mein for sure, but I would also prepare for the uh, essay paper for sure, 100%. Okay? It's a very important topic. And for those of you who are writing prelims next year, you need to be aware of what decoupling is, what de-risking is, the basics at least. Okay. Does it is it does it mean just economic decoupling? No. It's to do with complete breaking of marriage. Samaj mein aap sabhi ko? Clear? Okay. Alright. So that brings me to the end of this class. Before you go, please leave me a like if you enjoyed, if you learned something. And the mains question for today, I will be putting it in my group around say 12, okay. This will be a question uh, that you have studied previously, okay. And, and so make sure you answer me because I have some students who are regularly answering me and it's really good to engage with them. The kind of ideas that are floated in those emails is really good. So go ahead, this is my email ID for those of you who are joining me for the first time. If you like this class, leave me a comment. If you did not like this class, well, straight away, leave me a comment again. And obviously, go ahead and like and share this video with your friends. Share this video with, the, with your friends. Okay. Hall of Tech. I'm a newcomer to your class. Responding to each other. Oh, Hall of Tech, I'm extremely thankful to you for your video. My whole point is, see, even if I address the doubt of, agar ek bhi watching hai na, if, even if it is just one person watching, and if the person has a doubt, I will address it. That's my whole point. Doesn't matter if it is one or one thousand. Eventually, it's your career, so we have to take it seriously. Okay, okay uh, just a small announcement before I close the class. At 9, at 9 p.m. this evening, uh, there will be a presentation on Study IQ English uh, regarding forest guards. So, this year's prelims, you saw that there was a topic on home guards, which again, many students did not know. So, it came to my mind that another type of guards that most of us probably do not know anything about are forest guards. So, I have made a presentation about forest guards, what are the challenges they face. Because again, if India is to save its forest, its, its natural heritage and resources, you are going to have to empower the person on the ground, which is the forest guard. So, we are going to have a video on forest guards this evening at 9 p.m. I would really appreciate it if you took out time to go ahead and look through the video. Have a look at the video. Okay. Okay. This is my email ID, uh, Pratik, bhuvan.jha at studyiq.com. All right. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. It's been an absolute pleasure this morning talking to you. Uh, Pratik, Asha, Hall of Tech, Nalajana, Bhaskar, all, Bulbul, everyone who is a part of my class. I know some names now, some regular names who come always. So I'm really thankful to you and that I hope that you'll be watching the 9 p.m. video and you'll also join me tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Okay? Hall of Tech. Oh, please. I promise you we will make sure that your concepts are clear. Okay? If you put in the effort, I'm sure you'll be successful. All right, guys, I'll see you uh, this evening at 9 and tomorrow morning at 8. Do come consider joining again. Have a wonderful day. Bye.